Hello. So we're going to talk about the ventricles, um, and then we're going to talk about the blood-brain barrier. So the ventricles are the structures within the brain that carry cerebrospinal fluid. So cerebrospinal fluid is produced there and then circulates throughout the brain and the spinal cord from these ventricles. There are four ventricles. We have two lateral ventricles. You can see them probably better right there. We have a third ventricle right there, and you can see it right there. And then a fourth ventricle here, and you can see that one right here. The fourth ventricle runs from the third ventricle all the way down into the spinal cord. Cerebrospinal fluid is produced um, from blood plasma, and so it's very similar in composition to blood plasma. And it has multiple important functions. So one of the functions of CSF is that it provides buoyancy for the brain. So the brain is um, this nice large organ that fits in the cranial cavity. But if we were to take away the fluid from the, C um, the CSF fluid from the ventricles, our brain would shrink up. It would become like a little tiny raisin, not that small, obviously, but small enough that it could potentially collapse through the foramen magnum. And if you remember the size of the foramen magnum, your brain should not be going through there. So provides protection, so CSF actually provides um, or acts as a cushion. So any type of movements, like if you're being um, pushed real hard or hit in the head for any reason, um, CSF is going to cushion your brain so you don't get damage done. And then environmental stability. Since our brain doesn't have um, the ability to transport, so from blood, um, majority of materials in blood can't pass that blood-brain barrier. CSF actually provides a means to transport certain nutrients and certain uh, waste products to and from the brain. CSF is formed in the cor or by the choroid plexus. You can see the choroid plexus in this figure down here, and there's a diagram of it. It's I told you it originates from blood plasma, so it's very similar to blood plasma. I don't think this video works, so I'm not even going to try it right now. Um, if you have questions about the ventricles, definitely talk to me. Um, we can find this on the uh, internet, I'm sure, or you can look it up as well. Just look up brain ventricles fly through McGraw-Hill, and it'll bring this up. Okay. One disorder associated with your ventricles is called hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a disorder in which you have too much CSF. Um, when you have so much CSF on a newborn or an infant, this can cause um, swelling of the entire head because remember the head um, the, the bones are not attached by those um, fibrous sutures yet. We still have those soft spots. Those soft spots allow our bones to um, move. They basically allow our, our head to get larger. And if you have too much CSF, your, your um, bones can move out. And this allows the brain to um, get larger as well, which will, I'm sorry, my dogs are being all crazy, which will lead to the swelling that you see in these figures. Um, in an adult, hydrocephalus or water on the brain actually can lead to brain damage. And so there are different reasons that this can occur. If there's um, any damage to the ventricles or to the choroid plexus, um, or if there's a tumor in the brain that is um, blocking the release of the CSF, this can lead to these, um, this disorder. Uh, 
if treated, many individuals can live a normal life. But if not treated, most children will die at a very young age. And so the treatment is using a shunt. They implant a shunt in the brain that drains into either the um, stomach or into the blood. So here you can see the two shunts that they do. So the blood-brain barrier then is a barrier produced by the astrocytes as well as by the um, continuous capillaries that decreases the amount of materials that can, can move into or out of the brain. So pathogens, this, the basic idea is to prevent pathogens from crossing and causing damage. So this is a barrier, but the barrier is not, um, so it, it's not perfect, just like everything. There are some things that can still get through. Alcohol, which you have probably um, realized can get through that blood-brain barrier, which is why people tend to have, um, I don't know, less, less, concerns about what they do when they're drinking. They feel like they're awesome and they can do anything. And that's a lot of times why they end up hurting themselves, like because they're doing some new dance move and they twist their ankles, stuff like that. Um, anesthesia to knock you out also. And um, certain other drugs like cocaine is a very damaging drug that can actually pass that blood-brain barrier. There are three places the blood-brain barrier then is not located. Hypothalamus and the pineal gland. They're not located in these regions because the hypothalamus produces hormones that have to move into the blood. Um, same with the pineal gland. They have to produce hormones that move into the blood. And so they can't be... Um, you can't have a barrier there. And then at the choroid plexus where we're producing CSF from the blood plasma. This next section is going to be um, focusing on different regions of the brain. We're going to go over this relatively quick, um, being that it's yeah, we don't have a lot of time. I have kind of um, shrunk this chapter. So we're going to go over the major parts of the brain and the basic functions, okay? So the cerebrum is the large outer region. That's the re that is our conscious brain. It um, is composed of two hemispheres. The two hemispheres are identical, but they don't have the same functions always. That's what I'll say. Um, the cerebrum is the center of intelligence. Um, it's where we have our consciousness. It's where we get our judgment. Um, voluntary movements, visions, um, um, words that we hear, all of this comes from our cerebrum. So the cerebrum is connected by the corpus callosum, which is a um, tract that holds the two hemispheres together and allows for communication between the hemispheres. So when something happens in one side of the brain, both sides can process the information. So we don't have um, speech and writing um, understandings, the understanding, understood speech, understood writing um, on the same sides of our brain and in the same regions. So we need to make sure that we can um, connect those so that when we are reading something or when we're hearing something, we understand exactly what's going on.
So there's um, certain areas of our cerebrum that are um, given to the same functions. And then there are specific regions that have very unique functions. Most um, regions of our cerebrum have some form of memory associated with it. Memory of movement, memory of, um, of a sight, memory of a noise. Um, the, the differences come from more specific things. Uh, I will say that the left hemisphere is typically controlled by the right side of the body. The right hemisphere is controlled by the left. And um, this is because the nerves that move into the brain cross over. That does not mean that if some you have a stroke on one side of the body and one side of the brain, that functions on that side of the brain are going to totally... Um, be unable to work. A lot of times the, the opposite side can take over and learn to do the job. Your brain is amazing. So here are some basic functions of each of the basic lobes, the, the four main lobes I should say. We have the frontal lobe which is your um, communication, so verbal communication, um, decision making, your personality, your parietal lobe is for sensory functions, so being able to feel things, evaluating um, textures. The um, frontal frontal lobe, so we have sensory in the parietal, the frontal lobe, once once the parietal has taken in the sensory information, voluntary motor functions move with the frontal lobe. So if we feel something we like, we might um, decide to pick it up. And that would be that frontal lobe. Um, temporal lobe is very important in hearing and smelling. So understanding the sounds of things is going to be under that temporal lobe. And then the occipital lobe is for processing information um, that is visual. A CVA, cerebrovascular accident, is another name for a stroke. A stroke occurs when you have reduced blood to a certain region of the brain. I mentioned before that um, we have a blood-brain barrier, but the blood-brain barrier does not block oxygen movement, carbon dioxide movement. So the brain still can get certain things. It's going to be able to get um, glucose. It's going to get oxygen. It's going to get carbon dioxide. Things it won't get um, is, you know, pathogens or other things or the majority of uh, materials that move through blood, other proteins. And so when you have a stroke, that means you're not getting enough blood to the brain, which means oxygen isn't able to get over to the brain and you're unable to um, function properly. Strokes are, are serious and usually within um, the first few minutes, you are um, more likely to survive if you have it treated. So... Um, treatment for a stroke oftentimes starts with taking um, aspirin to help blood flow faster. And then once you have done this, then you're going to definitely want to get to the hospital so that you can be evaluated and they'll determine how to fix everything or what needs fixed. The cerebral cortex also has, ah, stop it, toddlers. Sorry, I'm not sure what he just did. Don't touch my computer, dud. It's my dog. Um, okay. He just, like, did something with the color. Okay. I'm going to leave it. Um, the cerebral cortex also has um, cerebral nuclei which is um, found within the cortex 
and um, these are called basal three, or these are called um, nuclei within the white matter are the gray gray regions um, that are just like buried in there, and these often help in functioning with like mood and in um, movement of the body. So one disorder associated with the cerebral nuclei, it is a mutation where you have multiple copies of a specific um, gene is associated with Huntington's disease. Uh-oh, it's not working again, dang it, because Dudley touched something. All right, I'm going to um, I'm gonna stop it. All right, we're back. Now it should be working. Yes, there we go. I was like, oh, no. So here are different cerebral nuclei, and you can see there's a caudate nuclei, or nucleus, I should say, the globus pallidus. Um, nucleus. Here's the amyg amyg amygdaloid body. These are all types of nuclei and they're buried within the white matter of the cerebrum. The next region is the diencephalon. The diencephalon um, contains the epithalamus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pineal gland. The epithalamus actually contains the pineal gland within it. Uh, and its major jobs are going to be sending signals to the brain, or to, not the brain, I'm sorry, to the cerebrum, so that we are consciously aware of different things. Um, sending signals to our um, limbic system for emotional understanding um, and controlling our uh, homeostatic, many of our homeostatic mechanisms. So this entire structure here so is the um, diencephalon. And this region up here, this large region, that's known as the thalamus. Back here is the epithalamus. And then up here is the hypothalamus. So the epithalamus contains, and I don't know why I have this circle there. That's probably not that. Well, I know that's not good. The epithalamus is back here. Okay, so you can see the area that I'm circling, you can see the pineal gland is right here. That's the pineal gland that's part of the epithalamus. So this whole region here is the epithalamus, okay? And the epithalamus contains um, the pineal gland as well as habenular nuclei. The habenular nuclei send signals to the limbic system so that we... Um, can respond to emotional or um, so emotional or visceral responses to different um, odors or um, any thoughts of these um, these odors and stuff would be sent to this um, to our limbic system. So that's our emotional brain. The pineal gland, which is right in the back here, this is where we have um, melatonin release. The pineal gland functions in regulating our sleep cycles so that we get tired at night and wake up during the day. And then um, and well that's that's really the epithalamus. So I'm gonna go to the next slide for the thalamus. The thalamus, which is right here, I'm sorry, this region right here is the thalamus. The thalamus is a re relay station 
um, sends signals that so it takes in the signals and processes them and decides which signals need to move into the um, conscious thought and which which don't so you can focus on what is important and not what is not important and then we have the hypothalamus the hypothalamus is um, a major region of our brain that functions in controlling multiple homeostatic mechanisms. So if the hypothalamus is not functioning properly, I'm letting my dog in for a second. If the hypothalamus is not functioning properly, no, then you're going to have problems with um, many homeostatic mechanisms. So the hypothalamus is uber important. Stop, and we only have one hypothalamus. The brainstem is the next region of the brain. The brainstem um, includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Um, the brainstem connects the um, cerebrum and diencephalon um, and cerebellum to the spinal cord. And it allows for um, information to move from the spinal cord to the cerebrum and back down to the spinal cord. There are three basic parts, which I just talked about, so we're going to look at these regions now. So the midbrain contains a region called the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra um, gets its name from its dark appearance. The dark appearance is associated with um, increased mel melanin pigmentation. Um, this region contains um, a lot of neurons that produce dopamine. And dopamine is an important um, chemical that is involved in um, emotion, in movement, in pleasure. Um, and so... If you have um, a damaged region of the brain, uh, of the midbrain, it can lead to Parkinson's disease or if you have a genetic disorder. Um, Parkinson's disease is associated with the lack of dopamine production. So when you have very little dopamine being produced, then you're going to have stiff or rigid movements. You're going to be much more depressed um, and these are signs of this disorder. The pons is the next region. The pons is a large bulging region directly um, inferior to the midbrain. And it contains um, respiratory and um, cardiac stimulatory centers. Um, so what these do is they send signals to the medulla and then the medulla controls breathing and respiration. Whoa, there we go, sorry. The medulla then is what controls both your respiratory rates and um, your heart rate. And so they take in information from the pawns um, as well as other information to determine if we need to increase or decrease the um, heart activity. So increase contraction rate to increase blood flow or um, for, for respiration. Um, do we need to cause people to breathe faster or slow down in breathing to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood? Cerebellum, then, is the region of the brain that functions in um, coordination of skeletal movement. So things like doing a cartwheel or learning to ride a bike, these are going to be maintained within that cerebellum. The last part of the brain that we really focus on are the cranial nerves. You have 12 cranial nerves, and you can see them on here. Um, the nerves 
run OOO to touch and feel. Very good leather. Very good velvet. I'm sorry. Ah. So that um, takes you to each of the olfactory nerves. Uh, not olfactory. Cranial nerves, which starts with olfactory. So the olfactory is the first cranial nerve, and it functions in smell. It is sensory only. Optic functions in vision, sounds, sounds like it, and it is sensory only. Oculomotor functions in eye movement, and it is a motor-only muscle. Trochlear functions in eye movement and is a motor-only muscle again. Motor-only nerve, I'm sorry, I say motor and I think muscle activity. Trigeminal is a mixed nerve. So it has both sensory and motor, which means it has both. Um, it functions in facial and oral feeling for sensory and in mastication for motor. Abducens is a motor only, functions in movement of the eye. Facial is sensory and motor, functions in taste as well as in facial expressions. Vestibulocochlear, it's a fun name, um, functions in both hearing and equilibrium. The glossopharyngeal. Functions in taste and um, that's sensory, and then functions in movement, pharyngeal movement, so movement of the throat, that's motor. Vagus nerve functions in both heart contractions, that's sensory, and then in pharyngeal movements, it's motor. With the heart contractions, the vagus nerve is actually what slows down the heart contractions to where um, our normal set heart rate is at about 70 um, beats per minute. The last two are accessory and hypoglossal. The um, accessory functions in movement of um, specific muscles and it's motor only. Hypoglossal functions in movement of the tongue and it is motor only. So the two things I use are O O O to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah. And then to remember if they're sensory or motor or they're both, I use some say Mary Money, but my brother says bad business Mary Money. All right. I'm going to um, stop this lecture, and I'm going to get into lecture um, chapter 14, okay? Bye.